Hey, uh, how do you feel about some high rarity cards, or maybe some foreign ones, or maybe be ahead of the game with others by preparing for future set releases with very quick shipping? Uh, check out EJ Gaming and use code British Five on checkout for five percent off on all your orders. Link in the description. Greetings, duelists, and welcome to another video. So this uh, weekend is the sneak peek. Uh, preview of Age of Overlord. Uh, basically, what that means is that uh, local uh, OTS stores uh, sanctioned by Konami uh, have uh, store owners have uh, cases and like boxes of the set, and it gives them like uh, as a preview to the players uh, before the official release. Uh, the official release of Age of Overlord is on the 18th, uh, pretty much a couple of days from now. Uh, however, during the 13th and 14th, uh, it is like, well, the 14th and 15th, rather. It is the sneak peek weekend where people can op open from that set and like start gathering from some of the new cards. When it comes to sneak peeks, uh, it's really, really cool. Uh, for a lot of players who are like excited for a set to go in and like see what's going on about see like how cards ratios like go from like a few cases or sets um, at the same time it's also very volatile when it comes to like spending because until the mass release of, of cards in a set uh, People are going to be on high demand uh, for certain cards, meaning that people who do like end up picking up certain cards in the set, uh, like end up getting like stuff that they want for their decks or strategies. Uh, they can pretty much gather it beforehand and don't have to worry about when the set actually releases for them to receive such cards. Um, that being said, so yesterday I was in two locals. Um, basically I was like 15 plus hours between locals, uh, trading, discussing, deck testing. I played in a tournament as well, um, uh, which was like with the egg of stuff, like legal, like just for that particular event, um, uh, which was really good testing. And yeah, overall yesterday was a full day of Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, I'm recording this on the Sunday 15th. Uh, I did a lot of testing and everything on the 14th. Um, but yeah, uh, today what I'm going to do is showcase you the first ever deck profile I have for post Age of Overlord. Um, by the time this deck profile is released, this probably would be like my probable deck choice for the foreseeable format, unless uh, I am more satisfied with other options. Uh, that does not mean that I won't be playing or testing other decks. It just mainly means that this deck showcasing you right here will probably become a priority. Um, but yeah, without further ado, um, let's begin. So... The deck I'm showcasing today, um, if you haven't noticed it by the screen right now, is going to be Labyrinth. Um, for people who have already been here on the channel already know that I've been testing uh, a Labyrinth hybrid. And I have been doing fairly okay with it. I'll go with the deck ratios and then I'll explain like how was my initial testing with the deck. Um, just not, not to waste any of you guys' time. So, yeah, let's begin. So, three Ariana, three Stovey, three Chandelier, Cool Clock, Lovely, Lady, Arias. Aruha. Charvara, Sarama, Abam, Chiyama. Uh, 
Labyrinth, Labyrinth. Prosperity. Abominations Prison. Welcome. Big welcome. Escape. Chamber. Karma. IDP. Skill drinks. That's it for the main deck. It's currently at 40 cards. Extra deck. Yama. Rage. Anguish. Abom. Unicorn. Griffin. Goddess. Muck. SP Caesar Zeus Chaos Angel um, I won't catch, I won't showcase your side deck just yet. Uh, I will get to explanations of stuff that I did side that were relevant. Um, but let's start with a few things. Uh, if you notice the extra deck. You will notice by counting, it is 14 cards. The 15th card in the extra deck uh, was uh, Tifon, the Stellar Nemesis uh, Star Crisis. Uh, but I had it lent uh, like at the time I was testing it and I had to return it. Basically, everybody who pulled it either kept it, traded it for something better than I was offering, uh, like got rid of it. Or just like, uh, yeah, pretty much those options. Uh, this goes back to what I was explaining earlier. When it comes to sneak peek releases, uh, unless you are like in a high demand of getting certain cards because you are rushed to play them at the event and you don't have to and you don't want to like wait for the official release, uh, I'd say just hold back on prices. Because once the set mass releases, cards that are not like super high end rarity, like the Stellar Crisis, uh, will just go down in price, like way more than what it currently is at. Uh, I was fortunate enough to like manage to get uh, SP and like pretty much the entire deck because um, Shadows to One Rocky Boy, um, these are basically his stuff. Um, I managed to pick up as uh, two copies of the Arias as well. Um, I will get to that explanation in a moment. And yeah, um, I played at um, like an Agov post Agov tourney, and I had one draw and two losses, and. All my draws and losses were basically because of misplays. Um, so I guess I can explain um, a little bit more in depth with the deck before I explain like all the ratios and stuff. Um, the Labyrinth hybrid of Unchained is way too strong. However, there are way too many lines that the deck has. And if you haven't practiced enough with the deck, you're going to miss out on some of, on some of those lines. And you might just like fumble a lot of the plays that if you would have done optimally, could just win you the game. This deck is insanely powerful. It has a lot of options to deal with like an established like format. However, like it's very easy to get tunnel vision in this deck because uh, some plays look linear but some of them do not look linear um, both labyrinth and dunchain separately are two linear strategies but once you pair them up together it stops becoming a linear strategy there are way too many more lines and combos and like 
scenarios and like situations that you're going to end up with this hybrid then you you have world ended up if you were playing like just a solo version of one of these two hybrids uh, i'll give you just one example i guess the tier uh, yesterday i faced a tournament and i was in a situation where my opponent had bahamut toad both mudora and keldo engrave Soliak and TC Boo uh, in the back row alongside Scream and Pearl Rhino. What if I told you that I had a line that played through all of that and would have branded up breaking his board? You probably would not have believed me if I told you that on hindsight. Um, but to give you more context, uh, like it was a situation where he ended up milling a bunch of my cards. And one of the cards that he ended up milling was uh, two copies of Big Welcome in the grave. And I had a moment where I had um, the Unchained Soul King Yama in rotation. And adding to that, like I had a bunch of Labyrinth Monsters on grave. I had a bunch of Unchained Monsters as well. I managed to uh, get Chiyama into rotation. And it just became uh, the... What made me ultimately lose that duel was is the fact that I forgot about Big Welcome being in my graveyard. And if I would have remembered, I would have 100% won the duel because uh, it would have made me play around TC Boo. It would have made me play around Soliac. It would have made me play around like uh, a bunch of this stuff. I probably would have played, be, be able to play around Toad like 100%. But I had enough other cards to like bait his cards as well. And... Yeah, it was very, very unfortunate. Um, I also faced uh, the Unchained quote-unquote mirror match. Uh, it was pure Unchained. And in that duel, he exhausted all his resources just to stop me from playing. However, in his rotation of his place, I had Lady Labyrinth on board and he flipped a bunch of, he flipped Unchained traps like on one scenario and I completely forgot about Lady Labyrinth being able to set my cards even if my opponent flips trap cards and that also what lost me the duel um so that's like just explaining like one or two scenarios that do come up with this deck that are just very very crucial uh in that particular duel i did not open any unchained cards i did not have any unchained cards in rotation um and one of the uh, duels i did brick and arias got was involved in that scenario and i will explain that uh, once i like explain the rest of the deck but i just wanted to tell you like all these scenarios that can or do come up um because that way if you were to play like a strategy like this one you can pretty much understand that there are too many ways to play this deck um uh one duel i faced was against manadium he built the full manadium m board which is like um ice jade this batter um the manadium counter trap the reframing alongside the ice jade so it was baron this powder ice jade the counter trap set and appaloosa for three materials and i almost broke through that entire board going second what made me not win the game was the existence of the ice ba uh, ice jade synchro monster that monster is really really strong against this deck um so if you're an unchained player like yeah uh, be wary of that card like being summoned if you're facing against the manadium deck because that card is really, really ridiculously strong and if it resolves like like it can outright like win them the duel uh against you it's incredibly hard to get rid of that monster so yeah uh since I already explained a few gameplay scenarios, I'm just going to go back and like explain the ratios on everything. Um, I'll start with the traps first. So, 
In a typical Unchained deck, you're going to see people either maxing out on these or playing two chambers. Uh, I opted for just two chambers and no unwailing. Um, and, and the reason for that is that in this particular deck, you want to resolve escape more than you want to resolve chamber. The reason for that is because resolving escape means that you're making a monster leave the field, meaning that your un uh, both your unchained triggers and your labyrinth triggers uh, both go into rotation. In this particular deck, this card is a bigger blowout than in regular unchained because it, the labyrinth cards like all of them triggering make it so you can chain block easier it makes it so uh, you have more advantage against your opponent it applies a lot more pressure on certain scenarios and yeah that's pretty much my explanation there when it comes to the welcome ratios uh i didn't find myself needing more than one welcome i think one welcome is perfectly fine uh if you end up like already been using it like in in the mid to late game scenario this will just keep resetting itself so like you don't really need like extra copies of this card it's also just bad drawing multiples of these so it, at the end of the day like you're perfectly fine with just one big welcome is a three of like that is like the most important card like probably in the entire deck this card is just ridiculously good like it's good even in the context of uh, using your own monsters. Uh, something really cool with this deck is uh, you're noticing the one copy of skill drain here. Uh, Big Welcome makes it so you can use your monsters even under skill drain. Uh, so that's really, really cool in that regard. This deck has a lot of big beaters. So uh, that's another reason for uh, like skill drain. I was asked why was I not playing Imperm in, in this deck. So despite um, despite Imperm having synergy with the Labyrinth spell and with and and the uh, Lady Labyrinth, I just didn't like Imperm because it is a one for one. This deck is already good at making one for one trades with your opponent because you have a lot of cards that are just like really strong when facing certain boards. Uh, there are French scenarios where Imperm would be very helpful. For example, the mirror, um, the Ice Jade one that I explained uh, earlier. That one is a situation where it can come up uh, against other floodgate monsters like Abyss Dweller or stuff like that. Uh, Imperm could be like very, very beneficial. However, I just felt like outside of French scenarios where the matchup is just like bad for you, you should be fine against most decks with just your engine cards. And I didn't want to be in a scenario where I'm just trading an imprint with my opponent and have it not be effective and just down a card because my opponent just kept playing despite me using the imprim. And like my imprim being like an unchained monster or being a labyrinth monster or being like an unchained trap or labyrinth, uh, like trap is just a lot more beneficial from my end than if something were to be played like Imperm. You can still play Imperm. Um, so now I'm going to talk about skill drain. Uh, and I guess I'll talk about uh, Canon and IDP. So going back to the Imperm uh, explanation, I wanted traps. Uh, I wanted my non-engine traps to be very impactful traps. Like I wanted the, the trap to trade more than one card with my opponent. And I felt like these three cards did that very specifically. Uh, the weakest out of these three is Ice Dragon's Prison. However, Ice Dragon's Prison being a trap that removes a monster on the field means that your Labyrinth monsters will trigger meaning that it actually has significantly more value despite it being like a one for one. Um, another really cool thing about Ice Dragon's Prison is that against certain scenarios, for example, like the tier limit matchup, let's say they have like the Soliac uh, Kaleido Heart setup. Kaleido Heart is a fiend type monster, 
meaning that if you control any of your regular monsters on the board and they try to solo you, queue, you can IDP, bring something back from your opponent, it, has to, it can be any monster, banish your own fiend monster they're targeting with the Soliac, and then banish the Kaleido Heart because it said it is a fiend type monster. And they lost their Soliac activation and then they lost their Kaleido Heart. Um, that scenario did come up for me like once or twice. Uh, also against the quote unquote mirror mashes, this card is also ridiculously strong. That way you have like a card that is a significantly strong and advantageous card against your opponent if you're facing that matchup. Like, that's the value I have behind this card. Uh, Daruma Cannon does not trigger your uh, Labyrinth card or Unchained cards. However, this card is really, really strong, especially now with Arias, because now this card uh, is like spot removal uh, like in certain scenarios against like certain decks. Like I'll give you an example. Let's say you're facing a purely player and they have like double noir on the board and you just have Arias and Cannon on hand. You can dump the Arias, set the Cannon, and then just flip the Cannon immediately and they can't do anything about it. Um, because like the Arias gives you the permission of activating a trap on the same turn. So, on that regard, this card is also really, really strong. Um, but yeah, yeah that, that is like the utility behind these cards. Basically, these cards are here to handle the situations where the, both the Labyrinth and Unchained cards could not. And they're easy to access, they're easy to trigger. Um, yeah, overall, uh, I think these are really good choices. So, I explained the traps, um, spells, I think it's self-explanatory. So, I guess I can explain why am I not playing, like, the typical, like, utility spells that you see in a typical Unchained deck. Like, the Thrust and the Talents and, like, other cards like those. Uh, I think with just the Labyrinth cards, you have enough utility to just handle a lot of things your opponent is trying, tries to do against you. Another really cool thing about this deck is that uh, this deck almost doesn't lose to anti-spell fragrance or like anti-spell cards because you don't play that many spell cards and half of the spell cards that you play are just cards that have other interactions even under those scenarios just mentioned. Um... You can even play the deck without Prosperity. I just opted for playing Prosperity because it's just more consistency uh, to this deck. Uh, this deck doesn't have a lot of weird hands. I have had weird hands like once or twice. It's basically hands where you don't see like enough of one engine or you just don't see like uh, enough of the starters from any of the two engines that you have in the, in the deck. Um, the most important card in the deck is probably Ariana. Ariana like, starts a lot of plays on her own. If you open Ariana in an Unchained card, uh, it's basically full Unchained combo. If you open just Labyrinth cards with Ariana, it's full Labyrinth combo. Like, yeah, I, I just think that this card is just a better starter than Tour Guide in a deck like Unchained. And that's what opted me to even play this deck like at the beginning. So I feel like yeah this is a really really cool scenario like a really really cool like thing about this hybrid um but yeah i think everything else is self-explanatory like we print three prison because at the end of the day this is an unchained card well it's not an unchained card by name but it tutors an unchained when it's popped and it can grab an unchained monster so that's it pretty much for like those explanations so let's talk about the Unchained portion. So in a typical Unchained Labyrinth deck, like the more popular ones, you only see Charvara and Escape. While in this version, you see a, like a full Unchained package. I just feel like the Unchained cards at more copies and at a higher volume 
just have a lot more utility. Like if you were to play like your typical traps in your typical labyrinth deck. Um, so just to elaborate a little bit further. If you're going second and you're playing like a typical labyrinth deck, uh, like outside of using stuff like Arias, which I will explain uh, a in a little bit, you don't have a lot of tools to go second with your current engine. Uh, but with the Unchained cards, this deck has a dimension where it can actually break through boards going second and then just make it so you can set up your own board if you don't end up OTKing your opponent. Um, and that's like really, really strong. I highly valued that in like this hybrid. Like playing more utility trap cards could be good in the Labyrinth deck. It kind of makes your game one are very very strong but i feel like you don't need a super oppressive turn one with this deck all you need is like enough cards going first so you can contest against your opponent's board and just follow up very strongly going second it something that we already know when it comes to unchained is that this deck is incredibly hard to like both break the board and otk against just because they have a lot of cards that just stick to the board and like either they float or they rotate or they like dodge a lot of cards that could just be massive blowouts against them there's no real actual blowout that can just get rid of your entire board like without them committing other cards so that's something very very valuable with this deck and that's pretty much like my explanation with the Unchained cards as, as a whole. I highly, highly recommend like this version if you're like testing like, out any Labyrinth hybrid. So Labyrinth ratios. So if you noticed in the main deck, I'm only playing one copy of the Arias, despite me having multiple copies. Uh, I'm not going to explain like all the Labyrinth cards in general. If you're watching this profile, you probably already know what they all do by now. Um, but let's talk about Arias for a second. So when Arias was first revealed, a lot of people were tunnel visioned on the application of this card on turn zero. Basically using this in your opponent's turn to just flip any generic trap and just use that use it against them. They could just outright stop their place entirely or kickstart your engine if you're playing a deck that is not Labyrinth. So that scenario almost never came up for me. Instead, the exact opposite happened. I had this scenario where I tried multiple areas. And I just kept opening multiple areas with no real card to actually set with them. I also tried a hybrid where I played like multiple areas and just maxed out on Daruma Karma Kana because I feel like going first, this is like one of the more impactful traps that you can use against your opponent if you're going first. Um, that scenario only came up once and it. I didn't even, I wasn't even able to do it first turn efficiently. I ended up doing it like on the third turn, like uh, after I just started baiting a lot of their cards. So my general consensus with Arias is it is a really strong card in this uh, deck. Uh, it being level six is actually relevant because she can be an XYZ material for the Hiking Caesar, which is something that actually did come up. Uh, your opponent responding to your Labyrinth cards and making hers uh, being able to be special summoned from the grave also comes up. It does come up a lot. And that's really, really important because it gives you an extra body to just like link climb with your Unchained monsters or link climb into other monsters like in general. Uh, this plus Ariana being able to make Chaos Angel also comes up. That is a scenario that I also had and like it's also really really strong like if you're going second and you're trying to contest a board if you're normal summon ariana and they let it go through what you can end up doing is like you can end up grabbing arias and then you just use the arias 
set your trap, flip it, and if your opponent tries to like respond to it, you summon the Arias, and then you can like synchro these two into Chaos Angel, and that's just another disruption against your opponent. Like, like Arias by itself does not like change the dynamic of the deck, but Arias existence helps with better interactions with the deck. If that makes sense. Uh, you notice I'm only playing one of each lady. I don't want to open multiples of these ever. Uh, I do see them enough. Like, you can make the debate of playing multiple lady labyrinths just because of how strong she is. Like, as a monster extender or as a monster, you just pip, uh, summon on the board. However, like, in testing, I just felt like... I didn't ever wanted to see this card in my opening hand if I did have no other ways of triggering it. It's pretty much like the same explanation behind like just one cool clock. Like you've seen probably lists like the Toronto uh, deck from Ryan Yu where he played multiple cool clock. So the thing about cool clock is that it's the same explanation as the lady. It's only good if you have other un uh, Labyrinth cards to pair alongside it. You can make the argument that you just play enough Furnishers to warrant like this interaction. However, if you don't see a Furniture and you end up seeing multiple cool clocks, this just does nothing at all. Um, you pretty much just have a dead card that like is not really doing any function like in the deck. And that's like my explanation behind Arias. I feel like Arias is just very similar to cool clock. Uh, the scenarios that Aria, uh, like, cover are scenarios where are just as hard if you're trying to use Cool Clock. However, like, the level of utility behind them both are equally the same. So, that's pretty much, like, my explanation there. But, yeah. Uh, this has, uh, pretty much, like, the the main deck so other cards that i considered um like i brought up earlier i did test out arias with multiple cannon um it's not the best approach but it's an approach you can take uh, you can try out in a more generic uh labyrinth deck without the unchained hybrids i think arias could be good at multiples however like at least in this hybrid it didn't do well in testing at multiples but it did really, really well just being in the deck. Uh, the third chamber, that's something that I uh, considered and I did test out. I feel like with the existence of the Labyrinth spell card, you really don't need a chamber that much because if you just flip the scape and you have that field spell, you can just start tutoring your monsters back and it would do like the exact same thing as this would end up doing. I consider third prosperity, but again, I think the deck is consistent enough as it is, and you don't want to open multiples of this card. So I just felt like I just really didn't need it at the end of the day. We have the Unwailing, uh, just another Unchained card. Uh, you can use this as another utility card just to like have your pops be more consistent with Charvara and Aruha. But I just felt like five traps was just enough and I didn't need like a six card or a ninth card rather if you want to count Abomination's Prison. Uh, the linking away and popping away your cards does not come up like a lot in this version. Um, you have like other cards that can help with utility just for those scenarios. So yeah uh already brought up lady you can play multiple ladies if you're like more comfortable that way i know some players are more comfortable playing more ladies uh in this hybrid um same thing with regular welcome i just feel like you really don't need more than one uh, but there are scenarios where people just want to play more than one uh disaster uh I feel like this deck has enough utility cards going second. And one interaction that I like in this deck a lot that just kind of replaces the scenario for Disaster is the scenario where you have like the A-Bomb and you end up 
um, and you end up pitching like Big Welcome. Like just summoning this and dumping Big Welcome to the graveyard applies a lot of pressure to your opponent, and it's really really strong if it ends up resolving. And this card is way less of a brick in this deck than in the than the disaster is, because in the off chance you can just dump it with a furniture and just reborn it later with chamber or you can just use chamber itself and just summon it from the hand or you can end up like popping your one of your own cards and just end up like use having the bomb serve as utility like in that regard so ultimately i just felt like i really didn't need disaster um but it is a really really good card it is very very strong if you use an uh, extra deck monster from your opponent because it means that you can uh, tutor out sp little knight like you can pretty much use disaster to tutor yourself into sp and then just start breaking your opponent's board like a lot more quicker that that way but outside of those scenarios this doesn't really come up So, uh, I tried out multiple skill drains. Um, I think in this hybrid, this card is fantastic. I feel like this card is really, really good. However, like I'm already at 40 cards and I feel, I feel like all the cards that are currently in the main deck serve as really good utility. And like, unless you want to bump it to 42, uh, I think just playing one skill drain is fine. Uh, I'm actually really shocked this card is still not limited. Uh, like, it's already limited in both Master Duel and in OCG. So, yeah. Those are my explanations. Very, very in-depth. Very, very, like, straight deck de profile. Uh, with a lot of explanations. I hope you found, like, this very informative. Uh, eh... If you want to play Labyrinth for this next format, or if you want to play Unchained for this next format, because I know that a lot of people are like reluctant on thinking if Unchained is going to be like strong post Age of Overlord, I really, really highly recommend this version. I think this version is very, very strong. Uh, depending on how it, my testing goes with other decks, this might be my go-to next deck, like post Agov. Um, but yeah, that's it from me. Uh, hope you found this informative. I hope you found this to your liking, understanding. Keep practicing and keep dueling.